Stanford University. I'm really honored to be here uh, for the uh, inaugural conference on uh, global development and poverty. And it's really great to see students, faculty, and professionals from so many disciplines coming together to think about shared prosperity uh, and health. You know, I've been both a, a, an infectious disease physician uh, working in some of the poorest places in the world and a university uh, president. And if you ask me which was more difficult, uh, treating multidrug resistant tuberculosis in the slums of Lima, Peru, or getting faculties to work together across disciplines on big problems, very, very close call, I have to say. But that's precisely your mission here at the Global Development and Poverty Initiative seeking transformative solutions to challenges of development and poverty that are necessarily cross-disciplinary uh, is exactly what a great university should be doing. This collaborative approach to solving the world's toughest challenges is something that we've worked to institutionalize at the World Bank uh, Group, because without collaboration that is both broad and deep, we have really little hope of accomplishing our twin goals, which uh, Dean Sullender uh, mentioned, to end extreme poverty by 2030 and boost shared prosperity. To accomplish the first, we have to reduce the proportion of people living under $1.90 a day to less than 3%. We, we looked at this uh, carefully, and because of natural disasters uh, and, and other th unforeseen uh, uh, um, uh, disasters, uh, it's hard to get it below 3%. To accomplish the second, we have to grow the incomes of the bottom 40% at least as fast, but preferably faster than the rate of uh, growth of the economy as a whole. These goals were endorsed by all 188 member governments of the World Bank Group in April of 2013, just about eight months after I started. And I was both delighted and a little bit surprised uh, that there was such unanimity uh, around the, the goals because they're the most ambitious in the history of the bank. Over my career, I've learned, and it's something that I think is uh, very well taught in business schools, uh, that setting time-bound targets is one of the most important steps if you want to achieve ambitious goals. It's true in the field of health, but it's even more true when it comes to the health of poor people. When I was working at the World Health Organization in HIV, we set this target get, of treating three million people in developing countries with HIV AIDS treatment, antiretrovirals, by the end of 2005, and that was just two and a half years after we established the target. Now, um, when we set the target, there were probably anywhere from 50 to 75,000 people in all of Sub-Saharan Africa in treatment, but probably 10 million, uh, well, at, at that time, probably at least two or three million by the definitions of that age needed uh, treatment. So this campaign of getting three million on treatment by 2005 may not sound uh, like much, and it certainly probably doesn't sound like much to the undergraduate students, but back then, uh, just about the entire global public health community told us that we were crazy. Critics told us that it couldn't be done. There wasn't enough money. There wasn't enough infrastructure. Some even suggested uh, that uh, treatment was too complex for African people because Africans did not have watches and would not be able to comply with very complicated medical regimens. But with extraordinary commitments, I mean, President Bush made one of, I think, the most extraordinary commitments that I have ever witnessed a president making when he established the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And also, uh, we had the Global Fund uh, to treat AIDS, uh, for, to fight uh, AIDS, TB, and malaria. These uh, huge new efforts, plus the three by five target, um, brought together a diverse set of actors, and we stopped spending all our time arguing about whether treatment was possible and focused on scaling up. And unless you have a target and somebody is counting, which is what we did at the World Health Organization, it's very hard to get people to stop fooling around and, and, and having, frankly, at that time, what I thought were unhelpful arguments. So by measuring success according to the number of people being treated, a uh, three by five campaign also encouraged accountability among both donors and recipients. When we announced the target, both the donors and the recipients were very angry at us. The donors were saying, how could you set such an ambitious target when we haven't told you we're gonna give you the money? And African uh, country ministers of health were furious because they were saying, you're setting this incredibly ambitious target without telling us how we're gonna get there. But by the end of 2005, the number of people receiving HIV treatment uh, had increased eightfold. 
And we didn't reach the target, but we did reach the target in 2007. So two years later is about the best that the United Nations system has ever done in, uh, in reaching a target. But today, um, almost, uh, almost 11 million people in the region now have access to, a, to antiretroviral therapy. And uh, the global goal for 2015 is 15 million people, five times higher than what we aimed for just 10 years ago. And uh, it, it, it's hard to imagine for me what Africa would look like uh, if we hadn't fought so hard for AIDS treatment. But you have to remember, and there's a lot of revisionist history going on, but the vast majority uh, of, of the global health community was saying treatment is impossible. For the 25 million people in Africa living with HIV, we're, we're afraid we're talking about the next generation. So all 25 million people, we looked them in the eye, global health leaders, and told them, I'm sorry, but you're all dead because it's inconvenient. And so, uh, you know, if you look back at uh, economic growth in Africa, it's been growing at over 5%, uh, even through the economic crisis that started in 2008. I cannot imagine that we would have seen that kind of growth if nobody knew their status and 10 million people had died in countries all over the, the continent. So as with all ambitious targets, uh, the global health community, uh, when we set the target, uh, had, to, had to fundamentally rethink what it was doing and focus on the things that would make the biggest difference. So access to drugs was a huge challenge because most, most of the developing countries did not have procurement and supply chain systems that were prepared to deal with just the simple volume of medicines that were going to uh, uh, pass through their systems. New strategies and alliances were required. Drug regimens, diagnostics had to be adapted to local conditions. New infrastructure had to be built and a whole new cadre of health workers had to be trained. But that's the beauty of time bound, and a uh, beauty of a time bound ambitious target. It forces you to change. I remember visiting a local health official in South Africa right before we started the 3x5 initiative who proudly told me that his team had met all its targets for the last five years. I very humbly suggested that, well, maybe your aspirations just aren't high enough if you're meeting every single target. As Paul Batalden is one of my heroes. He's a great medical doctor. He's one of the, one of the gurus in, uh, in quality improvement and health. And he, he said, and this rings through my mind every day, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it's getting. So if you want to do right by the poor, if you want to develop health systems that can, uh, that can, that can do things for uh, poor people's health that never been done before, you've got to change. And if you want to change a system, setting an ambitious target uh, is a great way to do it. So we find ourselves in a similar situation today with the target of ending extreme poverty. Uh, we have the targets in place, but what are we gonna have to do differently to actually achieve something that has never been possible before? We have never been able to see the end of extreme poverty. This is the first generation in human history that has been able to see that potential uh, outcome. The good news is that we've made a lot of progress. Uh, in 1990, when the world population was around 5.2 billion people, 36% of the global population lived in extreme poverty. And back then, the definition of extreme poverty was a dollar a day, less than a dollar a day. In 2012, with 7.3 billion people, so the population has increased, 12% lived in extreme poverty. In the last 15 years, we've gone from nearly 2 billion people living in extreme poverty uh, to less than a billion. This year, for the first time in history, we expect that the extreme poverty rate globally will drop below 10%, around 9.6%, 700 million people. This is the best news story in the world today. But we're deeply humbled by the challenge ahead of us. By 2020, half of all the extreme poor will live in fragile and conflict-affected settings. Uh, the prospects for economic growth in developing uh, economies has, is, is the lowest today as, uh, as it has been uh, over the past decade. Uh, rising global temperatures will have devastating impacts on poor countries and poor people. And as we saw with Ebola, major pandemics are likely to disproportionately affect the poor. Inside the World Bank Group, uh, for the past 50 years, we've continued to uh, distill and analyze our um, global experience in fighting poverty and boosting shared prosperity. And as a result, our advice to governments has evolved over time. We've taken a new look at the drivers of progress over the last 15 years and know that our approach also has to continue to evolve. Our strategy to end extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity, based on the best global knowledge uh, available, 
can be summed up in just three words, grow, invest, insure. So decades of experience have taught us that uh, economic growth is the primary driver of increased uh, personal income and poverty reduction. Sustained growth requires uh, macroeconomic stability in the form of low inflation, uh, manageable uh, debt uh, uh, levels, and reliable exchange rates. And government uh, policies and investments, though, have to prioritize growth in the sectors that will increase incomes of the poor. Not all investments and uh, not all growth strategies will have that impact on the poor. But the global economy, as I mentioned, is now facing significant headwinds, especially for the emerging markets. You know, growth is slower than it's, uh, than it's been for some time. Uh, and you know, the commodity super cycle, which has uh, driven so much of uh, uh, developing economy uh, economic growth, uh, has, it, it ended three or four years ago. And the depressed commodity prices, we think, will continue for some time. Uh, there's also an exodus of capital from uh, developing countries that's likely to accelerate um, as the, the Federal Reserve uh, increases its uh, funds rate target. We, nobody knows exactly when, but uh, it, it will happen soon. Now, you know, promoting growth has always been a priority for the World Bank Group. Uh, it, it, at times, it has seemed that uh, it was our only priority. Uh, other development goals, including investing in health and, and, and uh, the environment, were just not on the front burner for the World Bank Group. And that's why uh, 20 years ago, I was part of a movement called 50 Years is Enough. It was a movement that was focused on shutting down the World Bank Group on its 50th anniversary, uh, 1994. <laughs> now, you know, I'm very glad that we lost that argument because <laughs> I, get, I get to come here and talk to you guys. But uh, 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 the, the great thing about the World Bank is that we've learned from the evidence, we change, and we're now taking a much broader approach to development because we know that growth in GDP alone is not enough for us to achieve the twin goals of ending extreme poverty and boosting share prosperity. Um, we have been a producer of some of that evidence that, um, that has forced us to change, uh, but we're also an institution uh, that is ready to make changes in operations and policy based on evidence. Uh, and, and I'm sure the people in this audience know the evidence is increasingly clear that in addition to growing their economies, developing countries have to make investments in their people, especially in health and education. They also have to support programs and policies that ensure people against risks that threaten to plunge them into poverty because of events and circumstances beyond their control, uh, the so-called social protection programs. Now, among the investments uh, that developing countries can make in the health and education of the people, the most important ones start when a woman becomes pregnant. It's the combination of health, nutrition, and education of investment and insurance known as early childhood development. 26% of all children under five in developing countries are stunted. Now, this is a condition in which children are not only malnourished uh, and understimulated, but risk a loss of cognitive abilities, literally have fewer neuronal connections. Now, in sub-Saharan Africa, unfortunately, 36% um, of all children under five are stunted. Now, so uh, just to get your head around that, that's nearly four in 10 of Sub-Saharan Africa's children with, with, frankly, limited prospects in life. In my mind, this is an absolute disgrace. It's a, it's a global scandal. And in my view, really, something like uh, akin to a medical emergency. Children who are stunted by age five will not have an equal opportunity in life. It's difficult to imagine a path uh, to the end of poverty or shared prosperity without proper antenatal care uh, with, for mothers. Uh, appropriate stimulation, nurturing, and nutrition for infants and young children. Because if your brain won't let you learn and adapt in a fast-changing world, uh, you won't prosper, and neither will society. All of us lose. The World Bank Group is committed to effective action on early childhood development. We've identified uh, uh, five packages of 25 services for children uh, based on strong evidence. From 2001 to 2013, we invested $3.3 billion in early childhood development programs around the world. Haiti, Indonesia, Jamaica, Lesotho, Mozambique, Russia, Vietnam. Uh, using, and in, in one example, using innovative policymaking and uh, development finance tools, the, it was a little, one I'll talk about a little bit later, um, giving money only when the results are in, 
uh, we helped Peru cut its rate of childhood stunting in half from 28 to 14 percent in just eight years. We know that progress is possible, and progress is possible quickly, but we have to do so much more. What we need now is an ambitious global goal that will help drive our work in early childhood development. For childhood stunting, the world did set a target in 2012 to reduce stunting in children 40% by 2025. But that would still leave 100 million children stunted. This goal, in my view, is just not ambitious enough. If equality of opportunity is indeed a value that we all share, and we're serious about boosting shared prosperity, we need to work together to set a target to end the stunting for all children well before 2030. That kind of goal will enable us to hold each other accountable, forcing us to change the way we work. We need to formulate a plan to end stunting and use innovative financing mechanisms to pay for it. Now, ensure, ensuring that children have the neuronal connections to learn is only half the battle. We've got to also make sure that they're in school and actually learning. Today, 91% of children in developing countries attend primary school, which is up from 83% in 2000. So over that 15-year period, attendance rates in sub-Saharan Africa have gone up 20%. That's great. The number of out-of-school children of primary uh, school age has also fallen by almost half to 57 million from 100 million in, in 2000. But we cannot rest until every child is in school and every child is also learning. The evidence on learning outcomes, unfortunately, uh, among young people in many countries is really very alarming. Um, an estimated 50% of young people in Kenya who have completed six years of education cannot read a simple sentence. International assessments uh, also show that average, uh, eighth grade, the average eighth grade student in the Middle East and North Africa region performs below the international average in science and math, and in some cases, very far below. The low achievement levels that we're seeing throughout the developing world have devastating implications when, you th when people look for jobs and also will have devastating implications for future economic growth. I think that many of you, uh, of course, know of, uh, of Sal Khan and his great work at the Khan Academy. And I think this presents a very interesting model for boosting educational outcome globally much more quickly. You know, by, uh, with, uh, with $25 um, uh, 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 iPad type um, uh, devices and Khan Academy instruction, uh, we can put into the classroom uh, some of the best instructors in the world using technologies. You know, what we found is that teachers themselves learn how to teach important lessons by having the Khan Academy materials in the classroom. And so we're now working in rural Guyana and India, and also with Mexico and Middle Eastern countries to try to bring Khan Academy translated into those uh, programs because they'd have to wait otherwise 20 to 30 years before the quality of teachers gets up to where uh, it is, for example, in East Asia. Uh, the pilot programs we have underway uh, uh, are showing that technology can potentially transform learning outcomes. Uh, in in, Ligo, in La Lagos, Nigeria, for example, e-readers are being used to help um, improve student performance. Uh, and data shows that the devices have had a significant positive impact on students' nonverbal skills and uh, reading and math scores, especially among uh, students who do not own textbooks. So uh, education is an area that we've got to move, but health is the, is the topic of the day. And the great news, again, in health is that um, we have so much better evidence on the role of improved health outcomes in everything from uh, en ending poverty, but also economic growth. In 2013, the Lancet uh, Commission uh, on Investing in Health, uh, which is a team of, uh, of global uh, health experts led by Larry Summers, concluded that between 2000 and 2011, better health outcomes accounted for fully 24% of increase in what's called full income, not just, uh, uh, in, 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 it's, a, it's a complicated calculation, it's a great paper. Uh, the commission also determined that the economic return on investment in health in low and middle income countries could be as high as 10 to 1. Now, you know, even here in Silicon Valley, 10 to 1 is a pretty good investment uh, return. So uh, with the right investments, with the, with the right program structure, uh, we, can, we can reach what they have called a grand convergence in, uh, in health outcomes, meaning that a child in Cambodia and a child in California could have the same chance to survive and live a long and healthy life. 
Uh, this makes improving the quality of health systems everywhere a critical development issue that's essential to boosting shared prosperity. So in the calls that we've made and many others have made on, uh, uh, for universal health coverage, uh, we see the potential for a transformative program that can bring us toward this grand convergence. Uh, the challenges are many. Uh, the depth and breadth of these challenges were never more clear than during the Ebola crisis. We learned then that we are completely unprepared uh, for an epidemic. The outbreak also showed that we have failed over many years to build effective health systems in every country. And uh, that, of course, means that the weakest health systems are the ones that are going to accelerate any epidemic in the future. The deaths of more than 11,000 people and billions of dollars of economic losses in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone have proven this to us. Uh, these are three of the poorest countries in the world, but prior to Ebola, these were three of the fastest growing economies in the world. Uh, needless to say, their economic growth has been negative over the past few years. So uh, we need a robust capacity to, to respond um, uh, to epidemics uh, wherever they occur, and we also need the stronger health systems uh, that can diagnose and treat the sick wherever they are. Stronger health systems can extend the reach of nurses and doctors, and also not only, not only, they've been proven over time and again to improve outcomes in so many different areas, but we can also use them as uh, the front lines of our epidemic outbreak alert and response network. Just imagine what would have happened if in December 2013, the small, in, the, in the small Ghanaian village where uh, two-year-old Emil Wamunu, who was the first, uh, uh, the index case of Ebola, uh, 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 imagine if that village had trained health personnel linked to a disease surveillance system like there already is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Uganda. Uh, though epidemics, outbreaks in those countries were quickly controlled because those systems were in place. Uh, what first looked like cholera or, or a diarrhea would have been recognized as uh, potentially something far more serious and a quarantine would have been established in DRC and Uganda. Uh, instead, we didn't figure out that what was going on until three months later when a doctor who'd been treating um, uh, the, the sick had died. By then, the infection had spread to three countries. We, three months it took us to even know what was going on. One of the most important interventions during the fight against Ebola was behavioral change, and uh, this was absolutely critical. Uh, local customs dictated that people care for victims at home, and the custom also was to touch the dead bodies before uh, burial, and that's precisely the point at which the dead person is most infectious. Uh, the many Western doctors and, and, li and literally billions of dollars that ultimately supported uh, the containment effort would not have worked unless, uh, 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 if we had not had, ultimately, uh, people who spoke the local language, who knew the local customs, and had enough cultural capital to be able to convince people to change their behaviors. In the end, it was behavior change that stopped the epidemic. Now, we believe that trained community health workers can be vital to improving outcomes in many areas of public health, and also that they can form the backbone of a community-based approach uh, to uh, global pandemic response. Now, investments in community health workers um, uh, generate lots of other uh, good development dividends. Uh, they offer formal employment uh, for uh, women and often unemployed youth. Uh, they can also become pathways out of poverty and informality uh, for low-income and low-skilled workers. In India and Ethiopia, the World Bank Group uh, is supporting programs that train frontline health responders and give them incentives to continue on career paths in healthcare and other related uh, uh, social sectors, such as, in, in, in those two cases, early childhood development. Overall, our financing is expected to support and train close to one million mostly uh, uh, female community health workers in the areas that are needed the most. You know, there's still so much that we need to do to build effective global pandemic response. And just to give you a sense of it, uh, uh, vir uh, vi virologists, infectious disease experts are almost certain that something like a 1918-style flu pandemic is going to happen in the next 30 years. And that would lead to more than 30 million deaths and anywhere from 5 to 10 percent of lost global GDP. That's anywhere from 4 to 8 trillion dollars of economic losses. So uh, why is it that we have not yet built an effective response? Well, to do so, first, 
WHO has to be much stronger and better resourced. We need to provide more funding for WHO and put them in the position of leadership. We've got to um, uh, build these systems that I've talked about in every country in the world. And we also have to find the incentives for appropriate vaccine and drug development uh, so that, so that uh, the, the, the companies that can actually make them are involved in the process. Also, we need prearranged agreements. I got phone calls from, uh, from FedEx and from DHL and from uh, uh, Vodafone saying, how can we help? And because we had not pre-negotiated uh, uh, pre these agreements, they played almost no role. Uh, indemnity for uh, drug companies that had uh, vaccine candidates had not been worked out and it took forever uh, to get past that. We need to get those things in place uh, quickly. Also, uh, instead of waiting, we, we, we were the ones who put the first big money on the table to, for the Ebola response, but that happened in August, eight months after the first case. We need instruments that will, that will uh, disperse in eight hours or eight days and not eight months. And so we're now developing a concept that we've called the Pandemic Emergency Facility or the, uh, or the, or the, or, or the PEF. And the, uh, the Pandemic uh, Emergency Facility uh, is um, an innovation that would disperse funding immediately to national governments and responding agencies to support a surge, a quick surge in capacity in the context of an outbreak. Uh, but by, by doing this, uh, the, the so-called uh, PEF, the, the Pandemic Emergency Facility, would eliminate the availability of finance as a constraint on response. And you know, it's still unbelievable to me that we waited eight months before really uh, uh, putting the money on the table that was needed. So we're looking at a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, one is for this facility uh, to leverage resources from reinsurance and the capital markets and uh, um, spurring the creation of a whole new market for pandemic insurance for developing countries. Payouts would be immediate and uh, on, on, on the basis of a particular threshold. We have to come to, to uh, agreement on what those thresholds are, but we're getting there. Now, now, the thing that I like about this is it would bring market discipline to crisis response by creating incentives for data reporting and monitoring of diseases and promote investments in pandemic preparedness. Um, another possibility is for donors uh, to commit to providing funding um, to, to specific accounts that are already linked to this global system, but that would only have to be paid in the context uh, of, of, a, of a real uh, pandemic. Now, I have to tell you, when, when the pandemic is, is going forward, I get calls all the time saying, oh my God, this is potentially disastrous. We're willing to put any kind of money on the table. But then you have that high level of awareness, and that awareness just drops after a few weeks. So we're in that trough where the interest has dropped, uh, but we can't, we can't let that happen. And I've promised um, many people that as an infectious disease doctor, head of the World Bank, I promise that I will not let it drop, and this is why we're working on it. You know, my friend Larry Brilliant, whom some of you may know, said that uh, outbreaks are inevitable, epidemics are optional. We have to make sure that things like financing, things like getting, making sure the WHO is where it should be, uh, uh, and, and all of the different structures are in place to improve our ability to respond to pandemics and actually uh, build a system that will work. The momentum's growing. Um, uh, uh, Germany, which uh, hosted a, uh, a G7 leaders conference, asked me specifically to come and talk about this. Uh, next year, uh, we expect to have an even greater opportunity in Japan, where the G7 leaders, again, have put this issue of pandemic response on the table. Uh, we've got to put the institutional frameworks together. It's going to be complicated. Uh, but we cannot let another year or two years go by and not have a system in place. Um, uh, with, uh, with partners, uh, we're now also trying to increase access to financing for, for health systems. And uh, the, 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 the purpose of doing that is that um, uh, it's, not, it's not an automatic. There are, the developing countries all over the world are facing huge constraints. And so uh, we need to find ways of incentivizing them. So we built something called the Global Financing Facility in which uh, uh, the, the donors can put in money and then we use our own balance sheet, we use our own resources to take that uh, small amount of money and then multiply it at a ratio of around one to four. So with that money, we really think that we're gonna be capable for the first time in history of, uh, of building systems that actually work. You know, um, 
I, I want to stop because I want to have a chance to, to talk with you a little bit, but let me just uh, give you a sense of where we are. So in, in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, 11,000 people died. But every single person, every single American who was infected with Ebola and came to the United States for treatment lived. So we heard mortality rates of Ebola, 80% is what we were told. But that 80% um, is only true if you have no health system in place. If you have a system like the United States, the mortality rate was uh, empirically zero. Uh, what does that mean for us? How can we possibly talk about shared prosperity and ending extreme poverty when you have that kind of inequality every single day? Well, what we do at the World Bank is pretty straightforward. We have a balance sheet. We do $65 billion with the business uh, every year. And one of the great experiences for me as a medical doctor was to finally learn what rich people do every day to make themselves richer. And so we are now going to take our entire balance sheet and do everything we can to ensure that the poorest of the poor are uh, getting access to those tricks, those, those, uh, th th these fancy ways of using leverage and, uh, and, uh, and using swaps and, 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 uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, changes and in, in, in swaps and exposures. We're doing so many different things now because uh, uh, there, is, there is plenty of money in the world to end extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity. We could do it today if we wanted. If we just redistribute, we could do it today. But we found that those kinds of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of approaches where you equalize outcomes haven't worked well. It just simply haven't worked well. So what we're focusing on is uh, making the kinds of investments that will really create equality of opportunity and then using our balance sheet in every way possible uh, to make it possible to, to provide energy, to provide transport, to provide health and education and, and get to a point where by 2030 we will indeed be the first generation in human history to end extreme poverty. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to, 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 to taking your questions in just a bit. Thanks very much, Dr. Kim. Um, as a physician, I just want to say, first off, that it's completely inspirational to see you doing the kind of things that you're doing. And so um, we all owe you an enormous debt. Um, and I'd also like to thank you on uh, behalf of the Global Development Poverty Program, SEED, the GSB, and FSI. Um, we're absolutely delighted to have you here. It's interesting, a year ago when we began um, planning this conference, um, of course, Ebola was still happening, and it was very much on our minds. So this is the audience participation part. I want to invite people. There are microphones. Um, we want your questions. That's, the, that's really the purpose of it. Um, I'm going to kick it off with one, but please uh, step up to the microphones. And, and if students don't ask questions, I'll start calling on you, OK? <laughs> I, I haven't been in a classroom for a while, so uh, yeah. So let me start with, um, uh, I was struck in, when you were talking about uh, the, the issues that you face. You come from a tradition in physician with evidence-based uh, medicine, and, uh, and it, I wondered how evidence-based policy making might work. But so the, the question is really, what are the kind of things that you'd like to know the answer to now to do your job that you don't know? And is, is there a way that the research community could help with any of yeah. these? You know, on one level, uh, we, we just need to know more about what's actually happening on the ground. So there are many countries in the world where we haven't got poverty data for the last 10 years. So we just need to collect more basic data. But also, um, uh, you know, I'm very encouraged by some of these um, uh, randomized evaluations that have been done. Uh, you know, Jaime Sepulveda is here in the audience, and the work that they did in Mexico um, showing the impact of programs like uh, Oportunidades and others were just, you know, they, they changed the way uh, policymakers think. I mean, you know, these were, these were controversial programs. They were actually giving cash directly to poor people, right? And, and inside the World Bank, um, when, I got, uh, when I got there, uh, I just couldn't believe how many studies we'd done on these programs. And I said, why have we done so much on something that seems so straightforward? You give poor people cash, you condition it on them doing you know, basic things like making sure the kids are fed and whatever. It seems like uh, such a no-brainer. And they told me it's because ideologically so many people were against it. 
Right? So there was this notion that if you give uh, cash to poor people, it will take away their desire to work, and, but it was all ideology. And so we actually did a study and asked the question, do these programs take away the desire to work? And the answer was no, absolutely not. It in fact uh, uh, played the role of elevating them to the point where they could begin to see the possibility of joining the formal labor market. Right? So, so I think there's so many questions like this that we need, that we need to tackle. Uh, you know, on the policy level, getting some system where uh, the World Health Organization, the World Bank, other parts of the UN system, the private sector, country uh, bilateral donors are all sort of coordinated when that sort of 1918 flu pandemic style thing breaks out, um, that's really hard to figure out. I mean, I, how, how do you get the governance right on that? Because you know, what we found is that um, if you give it to a UN or a multilateral, if you give it to us, we're under so much political pressure from our member countries that we, I, you shouldn't trust us to give real data on, uh, on preparedness, for example. Uh, so you know, can we do this by linking with the private sector? I, I'm not sure, but um, we've got to keep experimenting until we get it right, because the stakes are just too high. I mean, you, know, you talk to these people in the reinsurance industry, and they're just panicked about this, because they hold all of the uh, business disruption policies. Right? So if a, if a pandemic breaks out and all these businesses have to stop, they're essentially facing the end of their own business because it would, be, it would be catastrophic for them. So the risk is so high, and yet our preparedness is so low. How do you, how do you, how do you uh, build global governance systems that would attack those particular global public bads that we just simply neglect? I mean, climate's another one, uh, very much like that. Absolutely. As someone who does infectious disease modeling, I share their concerns, yes. uh, certainly. I think we have a question back here. Hi, my name is Andrea Sprocket, and I work for a nonprofit called Metrics for Management. And I think it's extremely laudable that the World Bank has committed to serving the poorest 40% of the population. Um, part of being able to reach this goal is being able to measure it. Uh, so could you talk about how the World Bank is measuring how its programs that are designed to serve the poor are reaching those poorest two wealth quintiles? Yeah, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the revolution in, in measurement has happened in a number of different ways. One of the things that I'm most excited about, especially in the area of health, is something called the Program for Results. And uh, the Program for Results doesn't, uh, you know, we agree on a certain package, uh, whether it's our most concessional loans or, or our sort of quote unquote more market rate loans. And then what we say is, uh, let's agree on what the outcomes are going to be. And if in the area of health, for example, it's you know, um, malaria bed nets, or uh, in the case of stunting, the, the right package of interventions to prevent stunting. And then we don't disperse until after they show us that they've achieved a certain result. And so you know, it, it, it's a, it was incredibly controversial inside the World Bank when we started it. But the outcomes have been just um, uh, uh, astounding, really, really good. So, uh, it's not just even waiting until after the program is done uh, to, uh, to measure. It's not dispersing until you show an outcome. Now, we, we, we're, we started off with just 5% of our portfolio, and now we've gotten uh, approval from our board to go to 15%. There are other things that we do that are um, more sort of budget support, where we agree on a certain number of policy outcomes. We, we ask them to do certain things ahead of time before they get the the, the loan, and then the loan goes into their budget, and then we follow so that certain, uh, again, certain policy changes are, are, are in place. But we audit every single one of our projects, and you can look at the outcomes of every single one of our projects on the web. We've, we, we, my predecessor, Bob Zellick, opened this up to everybody. Now, are we measuring the right things? We're not, we're not convinced. And we just made a commitment to do household surveys uh, every three years for every country in the world. Now, it's a huge commitment. It's many hundreds of millions of dollars of a commitment. But uh, we realize that you, you can't track. See, see I, one, the, the thing I learned from 3x5 is that even if your numbers are not perfect, if you have the best numbers of anybody, you can actually create rhythm and, and pressure on the system. And uh, that's what we need to do. We need to find out where poverty is going down, where the bottom 40% incomes are going up. And you can't do it without household surveys. So it's a huge commitment for us, but it's, I, you know, we think it's the right thing to do. Question here. Hello, my name is Galina Fedorova. I'm a CEO of Goodler. It's an enterprise software to fight extreme poverty. And my question to you would be, we, the global goals are pretty ambitious, you would say, and limited resources, 
a lot of conflicts, and in one of your speeches uh, previously, you mentioned that involvement of global citizens will be a big part of that. So can you tell us what the World Bank is planning to do to involve global citizens in the process? Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, as, so just on that question specifically, you know, we work now with something called the Global Citizens uh, Festival Movement. And um, every year in Central Park, they have this really cool concert <clears throat> with, uh, with uh, celebrities. And so this year, uh, I was on stage, Kerry uh, um, uh, Washington from Scandal, which I'm addicted to, by the way, um, <laughs> because it was uh, it, 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 the, the person who uh, put it together as a Dartmouth grad, uh, Shonda Rhimes. Anyway, Kerry uh, Washington introduced me, right? And uh, I, uh, Beyonce was on stage, and I would get to hang around with all these cool people, right? And the idea is to create a global movement to end poverty. Now, I, I'm not sure if this will work, um, but, um, but it's fun, right? And, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I told my, I, you know, I have a 15-year-old and a 6-year-old, and so they thought, oh, well, you know, we've seen Dad with these people, uh, but... Um, uh, uh, now we're working with Novak Djokovic to uh, work on stunting. I mean, he, Novak is amazing. I mean, he grew up in war-torn Serbia. He had an opportunity. There were a lot of others that did not. And he really wants to make a commitment. So my 15-year-old son tennis player now thinks that I'm cool because I, I, I hang out with Novak uh, Djokovic. And uh, we, we actually sat in his box during one of the US Open tournaments. My six-year-old, uh, at this Global Citizen Festival, I got to appear on stage with Big Bird. Right? So <laughs> now even my six-year-old thinks I'm cool because I get to hang out with Big Bird. Look, I don't know if, I don't know if this will happen, but um, here's, what, here's what we have to do. And again, what I would say to all of you, and it's so good to be in the business school, because the, th the one thing that I regret um, now that I'm the World Bank Group president is it took me this long to really think hard about finance, right? Because th there's so many things that you can do if you have a balance sheet that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And so um, with this new sustainable development goals, 117 uh, goals, 169 targets, it's huge. Uh, the Secretary General asked us to come up with a vision for how we can pay for all of it. And it's a multi-trillion dollar agenda every year. So we actually sat back and said, so what would it look like? Well, um, first you have to start off by improving tax collection. Right? We think that poor countries can improve tax collection 2 to 4% of GDP. That's a huge amount of money uh, that rivals um, you know, the amount that is given every year uh, with official development assistance. Right? So, uh, uh, we also, if we stop the illicit financial flows, literally people taking money and leaving, or you know, uh, companies not paying taxes in poor countries, we can also increase the amount of money for development. And then there's, there's uh, grant-based official development assistance, there's concessional loans, there's public-private partnerships and private sector. So we think that altogether, we can find the trillions of dollars needed uh, to tackle this huge development agenda. Uh, but I think also young people have to get involved. You know? Um, I don't yet see the young people's movement around climate change that I think we'll need in order to really wake up and get, get to below two degrees Celsius. We're not there yet. And, uh, and, and so, so engagement is really critical. And so that's why you'll see me with Novak and Big Bird and everyone else. Yeah. Now we have students. I'd love to hear from and, some students. Now he's really glad he didn't yeah. end the World Bank. Um, yeah. <laughs> sure, in the back. Uh, hi, my name is Jawad Nabulsi. I'm a student at the JSB. Um, I also... Uh, Found a non for profit that, uh, in Egypt that focuses on illiteracy for primary education students, where 70% uh, of the kids in school yeah. cannot read and write. Yeah. My only little interaction with the, with the World Bank has been uh, a bit you know, confusing. Is that you know, my perception is that they're helping you know, the world and the NGOs, but when I approached the World Bank and you know, tried to get support, the thing is they, they said we focus mainly with governments. Yeah. And we did actually manage to get some money, which is <laughs> good, but the fact is I felt that there's maybe some kind of leeway or space where the World Bank can also try to fund and help uh, smaller NGOs in which they can you know, maneuver <clears throat> much quicker and maybe be uh, some kind of a, a connection between the government and the people on the ground. So do you see any hope of the World Bank kind of moving or shifting towards working with some different NGOs on the ground, or you think just governments and that's it? Well, so um, you know, we're essentially a cooperative. Right, um, a cooperative of 188 member countries, and uh, we provide loans. 
And so, uh, you know, the loans are, are, are based on sovereign guarantees. In other words, the country themselves guarantee the loan. Uh, so it's very hard to do that with multiple NGOs, but we've, we, we, it, even though it's hard, we've, we've done it. So we have something called the Global Program for Social Accountability, where we started with a small amount of money, 20 million, the Ford Foundation, the uh, Soros Foundation put money in, and we're beginning to provide grants directly to NGOs, but they would, they would be grants. Now, um, uh, uh, once we provide funding to a government, though, the government can make their own decisions about whether they utilize NGOs or the private sector to provide the services. So at that point, um, uh, you know, because it's based on a sovereign guarantee, uh, you, you, we have to go through governments for, for the private, the public sector side. We also have a huge private sector practice where we make um, loans to companies that want to work in developing countries, but also we take equity positions in those companies as well. So if you have um, a, a private sector company that's trying to solve some major problem in a developing country, come talk to us. Because, uh, you know, once again, you know, we have a very strong AAA rating and we can provide uh, financing for rel on relatively good terms. But even more important than the financing that we provide, if you come to us and the, the, the private sector group is called the International Finance Corporation, IFC, and IFC invests in your company, uh, it's almost like a seal of uh, approval. And then it's much, much easier to crowd in other uh, investors uh, to, get, to get your company up and running. So uh, that, that's just simply the, the way we work and the way we've been invented. Yeah. There's a question over here. Hi, my name is Nahama, and I'm a student in the Master of Development Practice program at UC Berkeley. I've read a lot of um, stuff that both you and Paul Farmer have written about partners in health, and the main two takeaways that I had from that was that a grassroots approach is really important, and secondary, that the approach that you go into one community with cannot just be taken and applied to another community. So I'm wondering, with your work at the World Bank, which is very top-down and kind of tries to take economic policies and apply them across developing countries. How have you been able to reconcile these points of view? Well, uh, you know, I, um, uh, first of all, the question is, what do you mean grassroots? Right? I mean, it, it's, uh, it's a complicated question. Um, I have to tell you that um, uh, if you were to say to me that the, the, our biggest impact has been on things like multidrug resistant TB and HIV, because we changed fundamentally the way people thought about it. And um, you know, none of those ideas came to us necessarily from the community. I mean, they, they didn't come and say, we really think you should treat multidrug resistant TB with second line antibiotics. I mean, that's not, that's not how they think about those things. And so they're, they're, um, uh, for me, the fun most fundamental takeaway from Partners in Health is that we started with a, uh, a very clear ethical moral principle, which was to make a preferential option for the poor. And then from there, we said, so given that our goal is to make a preferential option for the poor, what is it that we should be doing as medical doctors, as people who live in, in, in wealthy countries? And the conclusions were kind of unexpected, right? And, and I, I, I know what you're saying, and many people come to us and say, well, you should only do what, what the people want you to do in a particular community. But I've worked in so many communities, and so, sometimes the people in those communities can see exactly what they want, and, that, that, and then that's what you do. But I think what we've done is to say, okay, we can't do everything. We can't, um, we're not gonna do uh, a feeding program everywhere we go. What we'll do is to try to look at a particular problem and engage with you and say, here's what we're seeing. What are you seeing? And then once that process of engagement happens, you come together to a conclusion about what is to be done, which is exactly what we do at the World Bank Group. We do our own analysis of what any country needs to do in order to grow its economy, invest in its people, ensure that poor people don't fall back into poverty. But then once we do our analysis, we take it to the country themselves, and it's usually ministers of finance and others, and say, uh, and also civil society now participates much more than before. What is it that you think your priorities are? And then if we can come to an agreement, then we go forward. So I, you know, I've heard this before, you know, you're top down and we're, you know, um, uh, let me just put it this way. So uh, I don't think my philosophy, the notion of a preferential option for the poor has changed one bit since I've worked in the slums of Lima and in rural Haiti. I just have 65 billion a year I can put to it now, right? So, um, uh, you know, why do you think that eight months after I took the job, we established a goal of ending extreme poverty? 
because it's the ultimate way of expressing your, notion, your, your belief in a preferential option for the poor, which is, which, is the, which is the foundation of everything we did at Partners in Health. So the World Bank Group, this great huge institution, endorsed this notion of a preferential option for the poor eight, eight months after I took over. So now, everything we do, I can go back and say, okay, fine, I understand that. But how's that gonna help us end extreme poverty in the world? And because I can ask that question over and over and over again inside the World Bank Group, it's actually changing what we do. So, um, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, I, uh, Partners in Health continues to do this great work by ta tackling seemingly intractable issues uh, on, in the poorest communities. And now my job at the World Bank is to take those insights, like what I talked about today, community health workers, and scale it up, right? That's what we do, we do scale. We take great innovations that come from the grassroots and take them to scale. Question over here. Hi, I'm Tom and I'm from the Stanford Daily, the student newspaper here. Uh, you recently wrote about your experience as a migrant and spoke about the importance of tackling the uh, refugee crisis. So my question is, how would the World Bank uh, make sure, or at least encourage, individual countries to develop concrete domestic institutions to tackle these crises? It's a great question. You know, um uh, uh, the, the article I wrote was in the context of a report we put out. We, we, we do uh, something called the Global Monitoring Report, and this year, uh, or this particular issue was on demographics. And what we showed was that in a lot of advanced economies, their aged population is increasing, their working population is shrinking, and their birth rates are low. So for them, the most important thing that they can do in many ways from the perspective of economic growth in the medium and long term is to attract migrants, right? And I said, I've said many times that xenophobia turns out to be a terrible economic policy uh, for uh, advanced economies. Now, that was taken out of context. I was accused of calling you know, certain countries xenophobic, I, which I was not. But um, there's so much great evidence now that suggests to us that xenophobia is a bad economic strategy. Sexism is a terrible economic strategy. You know, um, uh, South Korea, uh, has the lowest uh, female participation in the workforce of any OECD country. And you, know, you can actually measure how many percentage points of GDP they would increase if they just uh, uh, set up a social structure that women could participate in the workforce. It turns out that ageism, not listening to young people, is a terrible economic strategy because young people are coming at the digital world completely differently. So what we're trying to do is put that evidence in front of our member countries, right? That uh, xenophobia is a bad strategy, sexism is a bad strategy, uh, you know, m marginalization, inequality. We've got uh, lots of data now that very high levels of inequality actually slows economic growth. So all these things that I used to proclaim, um, uh, not based on evidence, and uh, only because we thought it was the right thing to do, it turns out that now uh, we have evidence that suggests it's economically also the right thing to do. Isn't that great? I mean, I, 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 uh, I, think, that's, I think that's just, that, that's great. And so, uh, um, but it's not simple. And so one, one of the things we're doing is we're trying to create employment opportunities for Syrian refugees in Jordan. And how do you do that? Because it's, you know, uh, where's the money gonna come from? So we're working with the UK, uh, with the European Union, and the Jordanian government to try to create um, uh, very specific employment projects for Syrians but also for, for Jordanians. So if we can find a way to go out and raise a bond, but then have the UK buy down the interest and then open up European markets, uh, you know, preferential access, access to European markets with, uh, you know, for, for the products made in these little projects, we could actually create a level of stability and employment for refugees uh, that, that would not otherwise have happened if we would sort of stayed in our own boxes. So we're looking across the Middle East uh, into Africa to find much, much better ways of dealing with refugees. The fundamental point is we have separated political negotiation, humanitarian response, and development forever. And we are now uh, saying we can't do that anymore. We have to bring all of those together and think about um, how do you, in, you know, prior to a conflict happening, how do you think about regional development initiatives that might actually lower the possibility that a conflict would erupt and that you'd have to mount a humanitarian response? Not easy, but uh, we, we've got, you know, we, the, the standard approach has worked so poorly for so long that we're gonna try uh, all kinds of new things. 
With that, unfortunately, we're going to have to close. Please join me in thanking Dr. Kim for his talk. Stanford University.